Against a backdrop of regional tensions and global competition, the world is watching China's military modernization and looking for clues as to the force's readiness. Sometimes those clues are subtle, and other times they take the form of the very public removal of nine senior military leaders from their positions in China, or Bloomberg publishing an article including claims of serious corruption in the Chinese military and defense industrial base. The article talked about missile fuel tanks full of water, not fuel, silo doors that wouldn't open, and generally added fuel to the fire of an old debate. Namely, just what state is the People's Liberation Army in, on that spectrum from Paper Tiger to the modernizing and increasingly formidable force that it presents itself to be? The answer likely has serious implications for the region and the world. And so today, we're going to talk about it. We'll start with general context around Chinese military modernization, corruption, and anti-corruption efforts. Then I'll go through some of the specific claims in the Bloomberg article, ask how likely it is that missiles are actually being filled with water, and then zoom out to ask how this may all impact Chinese military readiness and the balance of power in the region. The caveats I'll apply here are that firstly, this is not a full video on Chinese military capabilities, although I hope I'll get to that eventually. Secondly, that a lot of the data I'll be using on corruption in China derives directly or indirectly from Chinese government sources. And thirdly, that there's a lot of uncertainty and information gaps relating to this topic. I'm not a China expert, but I understand enough to know just how much we don't know. So with that said, let's dive into the shadowy world of military corruption after a quick word from a sponsor. And today I get to welcome back a returning sponsor and my VPN of choice, Private Internet Access. In life, we can put a lot of effort into bringing the right tool to mitigate a given risk. If you might puncture a tire, you carry a spare one. If you might take a hit playing sport, in goes the mouth guard. And if you're going to be crossing emu territory, preferably you do it in a main battle tank. At least then the fight will be fair. But if the risks you're concerned about have to do with your privacy online, you might want good practices, a secure password, and a VPN. With a click, a VPN can allow you to reroute your internet traffic, change your publicly perceived IP address, and potentially change how it's logged. No matter how common data breaches become, you can't compromise something that doesn't exist. And private internet access notably say that they have a no-logs policy that has been independently audited and tested in court. The codebase is open source, it's available cross-platform. And when you do go to Connect, you'll find they have servers in 91 countries and 50 US states, as well as dedicated IP hubs in popular locations like Brussels and Silicon Valley. And if you do want to take advantage of things like the advertised streaming service compatibility across multiple devices, then the good news is with one subscription, you can protect an unlimited number of devices. So if you're interested, there's a link in the description you can check out. It'll give you an 83% discount on a two-year subscription, plus four bonus months, covering an unlimited number of devices with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Also relevant for some of you listening, they've recently launched their Privacy Pass. This is a special free subscription that they advertise as being available to groups like NGOs, charities, journalists, or those delivering humanitarian aid in areas where digital privacy is under threat. So if you fall into one of those categories, you may also want to check them out. So with my thanks once more, let's get back to the episode. The modernization of the People's Liberation Army has been perhaps the most dramatic military transformation of the 21st century. And I've previously done a video describing the massive increases in military spending and the Chinese defense industrial base that have made that possible. Officially, Beijing doesn't recognize its military as being either fully modernized or a current peer of the United States. Instead, it represents itself as an up-and-coming force aiming to create a modernized military by 2035. And while all arms of the People's Liberation Army have seen significant transformation, the People's Liberation Army rocket force has arguably been at the vanguard of China's growing military capabilities. But even the best systems on the planet are ultimately vulnerable to human factors. And so understanding the likely capabilities of the rocket force probably means more than just studying missile data sheets. It also means understanding the force that operates them and the potentially corrosive impact of corruption. So to get into the guts of it then, let's talk about corruption and graft in China. Because if you want to understand what corruption in the military might look like, then it probably helps to start with the context of corruption more generally and what recent Chinese anti-corruption efforts have looked like. The Chinese state, like many others, has been struggling with the issue of corruption for basically its entire existence. It's in China that we can find records of some of history's oldest anti-corruption efforts, when the Emperor Wu, more than 2,000 years ago, established the office of regional inspector to control and supervise provincial officials. The Han Dynasty, which was really into doing bureaucracy before it was really cool through most of the world, also established a full-time supervisory agency. And in the more than two millennia that followed, China's imperial government structure would usually have central institutions and apparatus, whose roles included monitoring the realm, its officials, and how policies were being implemented. And some of those institutions left records that have survived. 
For example, I found reference to a study which looked at a 10-year period from 1424 to 1434, showing that, on average, roughly 70 officials were denounced per annum, about 67% of them were nobles or Category 1 officials, and that the share of those officials who were subsequently demoted or punished, what you can think of as essentially the conviction rate, varied from about 50% of those denounced if you were at the top of the hierarchy, up to a stunning 91% if you were from the lower ranks. Fortunately, of course, no society would ever again create a justice system in which the very wealthy and powerful were more likely to be able to escape criminal responsibility for their alleged misdeeds. In the modern People's Republic of China, corruption continues to be a very significant issue. In 2023, researchers from Columbia University and the University of Wisconsin-Madison estimated the proportion of government officials in China with unofficial or grey incomes as ranging from roughly 8% of sub-managerial level civil servants up to 65% when you move a little further up the chain, such as someone who might be the mayor of a small or medium-sized city or senior in the administrative hierarchy. The monetary scale of the alleged corruption also varies considerably by seniority, with the researchers estimating that the lowest ranks involved might top up their salary by an additional 27% using additional enterprise, but for the more senior officials, the amounts involved were often many times higher than their official salaries. There's some interesting official Chinese data to cross-reference there, but we'll come back to that in just a moment. In 2022, the Corruption Perception Index gave China a score of 45 out of 100, ranking it 65th out of 180 countries globally. Now, 45 obviously isn't great and still places China in the middle third globally, but it is an improvement from the 2014 level of 36. Beijing also publishes official data on the legions of officials that are charged with corruption offences every year. So while different sources may be in conflict over the exact scale and nature of the problem, the overwhelming majority of sources inside China and out agree it's a significant issue. The why and how of corruption in China is hard to go into quickly. In one sense, you have factors which could equally apply anywhere. Greed is an unfortunately common human motivator, and the pay rates for many Chinese officials are probably lower than you might expect. Before the massive pay rises in 2021, for example, a division-level leader in the People's Liberation Army might earn a total annual compensation of about 42,000 American dollars per year. And no amount of purchasing power adjustment is likely to save you if you have very senior officers being paid less than an American first lieutenant. Then, of course, you can pair universal motive with common opportunity. The sheer scale of the Chinese government, civil service, and military means there's a lot of officials out there. Officials can wield power, and so they can also hypothetically misuse it. On top of that, you also have more uniquely Chinese characteristics. There is a term we'll come back to later, guangxi, which basically means an individual's connections, network, uh, mutual support. Those who've done business in China often describe the importance of networks of personal relationships to getting things done. But apply that system in a government context, and you can probably see the dangers. With power and resources being potentially misused or misdirected to the benefit of the well-connected. Just as corruption in China is a problem, anti-corruption campaigns are also nothing new. But anti-corruption campaigns and rhetoric have taken on particular prominence during the more than decade of Xi Jinping's leadership in China. And it's important to remember here that Xi is more than just the President of the People's Republic. He metaphorically wears three of the most important organisational hats in the country, being the President of the People's Republic of China, the nation, the General Secretary or leader of the Communist Party of China, and the Chairman of the Central Military Commission, the body which controls the PLA, the People's Armed Police, and the Chinese militia. And basically what that means is that if you are an official or state employee of any significance in the People's Republic, you are almost certainly in a vertical of power that ultimately leads directly or indirectly to Xi Jinping. And as he rose to the top jobs more than 10 years ago, one of the first things he did was very publicly place corruption in the crosshairs. And that meant, using the translated language, targeting both tigers and flies. The flies, in this case, being low-level officials engaged in petty corruption, basically the petty abuse of power, misuse of government assets, everything from taking too much from the stationary cupboard through to having a wild night out and then putting that on your government credit card. But the tigers, by contrast, were those with more serious power, more significant positions, and often a lot more money at stake. To give you a sense of scale here, in 2023, researchers published an analysis of data, including from China's Central Commission for Discipline Inspection. They indicated that between 2012 and 2021, approximately 3.7 million officials and cadres were punished by the CCDI. Those, to use the Chinese parlance, are your flies. But in terms of where the actual money is when it comes to corruption, they estimated it was very much top-heavy. 
giving an estimate that the top 10% of corrupt officials were responsible for about 60% of total corruption, and the top 1% of offenders, 21%. Over that same time period, 10 principal and 92 deputy provincial leaders were convicted, five departmental leaders of the state council and 17 deputies convicted, and there were even convictions at the national level. Overall, their data showed that roughly 1% of China's senior leaders were being convicted of corruption every year, which, to give you a sense of scale, would mean convicting roughly five US congressmen for corruption every year and a state governor every two. In terms of monetary value, when looking at a sample of 822 cases involving individuals that might be called tigers, the average amount involved per case was 5.1 million US dollars at 2018 exchange rates for government officials and $6.6 million for the employees of state-owned enterprises. And as we discussed in my original video on how corruption can destroy armies, a dollar, or in this case billions of dollars being stolen, can do a heck of a lot more than one or a billion dollars damage to a country or an organization. And these figures relate only to corruption that is discovered, prosecuted, results in a conviction, and for which the data is subsequently published. I'll also point out that when you're talking about anti-corruption efforts in China, it's often about more than just prosecutions and convictions. Sometimes it's about the symbols of corruption and excess. One target was golf. Back in 2015, a state-run newspaper complained that, quote, the golf course is gradually changing into a muddy field where they trade money for power, end quote, in reference to corrupt officials. In 2017, the government cracked down. Party officials were banned from playing during work hours, which is something that sounds like it should have already been a thing. Inspectors were reportedly sent to golf courses to find wayward officials who should be doing something else. About a fifth of all golf courses in China were closed down, and the construction of new ones was banned. We'll have to see how that one goes, though, because China reportedly banned the development of new golf courses in 2004, when the country had fewer than 200 courses. And yet, by 2017, when the new crackdown hit, there were more than 600. Courses were often built under the guise of being parks or other sorts of projects. In one case, published by Chinese state media, allegedly an illegal golf course boasting 58 on-site villas was originally built as a, quote, public sports park, end quote, one that just so happened to be laid out pretty much like a golf course, and was then quietly converted into one after it was completed. So yeah, even if your corruption campaign is literally targeting millions of people, you should never underestimate the determination of some people to find a loophole. And here's the thing. While the recent removal of some very senior military leaders was obviously dramatic, it's not the first time we've seen this kind of thing over the last decade. Back in 2014, we were discussing the downfall of a number of PLA Tigers. One had been the deputy director of the PLA's General Logistics Department, which, as far as job titles go, sounds pretty close to being the gold standard for maximum possible corruption opportunities for any sufficiently enterprising individual. Other officials gone after around the same time included the former head of the State-Owned Assets Supervision and Administration Commission, a former Vice Minister of Public Security, and General Zhu Kaiho. General Zhu in particular was a very senior scalp. He was Vice Chairman of the Central Military Commission from 2004 to 2012, sat on the Chinese Communist Party's Central Committee from 2007 to 2012, and was at that point probably the most senior military officer to ever be publicly investigated for corruption in the People's Republic of China. He was also allegedly a very enterprising fellow. Indeed, a true master of personal finances and economic management. Because presumably disappointed by his government salary, which would at the time have numbered in the tens of thousands of US dollars per annum, the general, again allegedly, developed a number of side hustles. And we're not talking money burners like getting into an MLM here. No, 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 he figured out how to make some serious money. You see, given his position as vice chairman of the Central Military Commission, Zhu was in a position to control a significant number of military promotions. Of course, in most countries, military promotions are meant to be decided on merit. And the general appears to have decided that that was all well and good, as long as you define someone's merit based on how much money they were willing to pay. It was alleged that he took exorbitantly high payments in exchange for appointments to senior military positions, and according to some claims, there may have even been an informal price list for various ranks, positions, and other privileges. Because if you really want to innovate and get ahead in the corruption space, apparently you need to deliver it with all the convenience of a drive through menu. Across multiple militaries and different historical time periods, whenever promotions for pay has been a product on sale, demand has been strong. And so the general allegedly made a ton of money. 
And I want to stress there, I don't mean that figuratively. It's reported that when investigators raided his home, they recovered more than one metric ton of cash. And between gold, cash, precious metals and gifts, even things like historical artefacts and artworks, some of which was still packaged, it's claimed, in individual boxes marked with the names of individual officers, which in terms of criminal evidence is really only one step removed from writing this is a bribe on the box, it reportedly required the better part of a dozen trucks to take the whole thing away. Now, the former head of general logistics we mentioned earlier would receive a suspended death sentence, something which probably means in practice either life or a very long time in prison. Zhu, meanwhile, didn't because he died, allegedly of blood cancer, before he could be convicted. But I bring his story up because if even a fraction of the details are true, they represent a truly stunning level of corruption in the PLA. But there, for completeness, I do just want to sound a warning. What I'm about to say is, I think, generally applicable to a lot of news coverage, but particularly when you're talking about potentially sensitive topics, like the prosecution of very senior officials on corruption charges. Beyond just the obvious, things like understanding the difference between what's being reported and what you actually know, I think there are a few things that need to be kept in mind. Firstly, when you're dealing with anti-corruption campaigns, it can become hard to differentiate between an anti-corruption effort and a political purge. Often, the corruption itself can be very genuine, especially if you're operating in a system like Russia where a very large number of people are likely to be corrupt. In that context, the political decision might not be to try and frame someone who isn't corrupt on corruption charges, but rather to selectively choose which corrupt officials you choose to focus on and actually act against. In Russia, for example, corruption charges are a popular way to remove oligarchs who have fallen out of favour. Does that mean all the other oligarchs and political figures are not themselves corrupt? Of course it bloody doesn't. But it does mean that, at least for the moment, the Russian state has decided to leave them be. Warning too is that when you talk about official statements about corruption charges, be aware that the language might be very carefully chosen and modulated. And always try and understand where the underlying motivations of those involved might be different than just trying to enforce the rules as written. In a Chinese context, that might mean asking whether or not a given action has any sort of political dimension. Not in the same sense as a conflict between political parties in a multi-party democracy, but rather the relationships and balance of power between different institutions and factions within them. One example might be the relationship between the military and senior military leaders and the party and its civilian leadership. Whereas in many countries, the military is first meant to be loyal to the nation, in China, the armed forces are meant to be subservient to the party. If you want evidence of just how important that principle is to some Chinese leaders, we can just look at some of the remarks Xi later made in relation to the case. Xi is reported to have said the military should seriously reflect on the violations of discipline and law that the former general's actions represented. But at the same time, he also reportedly used the opportunity to emphasise the importance of the Communist Party of China having absolute control over the military and reprised an old Mao quote, the party commands the gun. The speech emphasised the need to, quote, never slacken the efforts to deepen the fight against corruption in the army, end quote. But in English language, Chinese state media, those ideas were often presented alongside the importance of strict political control. And so it's possible that as well as just being an anti-corruption measure, these arrests may also have had a political or signalling purpose. There are plenty of examples across history of a new leader coming to power and demonstrating and securing their authority by launching an anti-corruption campaign against significant figures. Kind of like the Hollywood idea of rolling into a prison and punching the biggest guy present in order to establish dominance, publicly tearing down a former vice chairman of the Central Military Commission and sentencing another general to death might be taken in some quarters as an indirect reminder that even the very powerful might not be untouchable and which groups or individuals ultimately run the show. Plus, in situations where you end up removing someone from a position of power, that might mean you're now in a position to put someone else in that important chair potentially someone who will be very grateful and loyal for you doing so. If you're talking about the exercise of party control over the military in China, it can be exercised and demonstrated in a number of ways. Control at lower levels can be exercised through political education. Philip Saunders at America's National Defense University estimates that Chinese troops spend about a quarter of their time on political work, and I desperately want to know if they use PowerPoint during it. Further up the hierarchy, however, you can imagine plenty of ways in which the party might try and establish and demonstrate its control. And while it's never possible to know for sure, in some cases doing a little bit of tiger hunting might be one of them. And just in case the message that no one was truly untouchable was ever lost, December 2023 closed with a number of high-profile removals. Nine PLA generals were removed from positions that provided them a degree of protection from investigation and prosecution, 
and we found out that China now had a new defence minister, after the last one just kind of disappeared for a while. And this time, the highest-ranking targets weren't in logistics functions or making promotion decisions on the CMC. No, this time the focus was on the People's Liberation Army Rocket Force, formerly known as the 2nd Artillery Corps, the independent military arm under the direct control of the Central Military Commission that holds and operates a majority of China's arsenal of ballistic, cruise, and hypersonic missiles. Which brings us to the Bloomberg report and its claims around the impact of corruption in action in the Chinese rocket force. And when that article dropped on January 6, it painted a fairly dismal picture. And there are four claims in the article that I want to work through sequentially. The first two are quite specific and had to do with parts of the Chinese rocket force. This included a claim that parts of the Chinese force had reversed the usual North Korean way of doing things, and instead of trying to fill the ocean with as many expensive missiles as possible, as is North Korean practice, were instead trying to fill their missiles with water. To quote the article, the US assessments cited several examples of the impact of graft, including missiles filled with water instead of fuel, end quote. And to make matters apparently worse, this was presented alongside a claim that, quote, vast fields of missile silos in western China have lids that don't function in a way that would allow the missiles to launch effectively, one of the people said, end quote. But hey, that sounds like they're at least committed to the bit. If you can't open the silo doors, no one's ever going to be able to try and fire the missile and find out it's filled with water. Beyond those two specific claims, however, the article also presented some more general assessments. These included issues of readiness, like, quote, widespread corruption undermined his efforts to modernise the armed forces and raised questions about China's ability to fight a war, according to people familiar with the assessments, end quote. And that finally, things might be so bad that it may actually impact China's willingness to escalate in the region. Like, quote, corruption inside China's rocket force and throughout the nation's defence industrial base is so extensive that US officials now believe Xi is less likely to contemplate major military action in the coming years than would otherwise have been the case, end quote. Now, obviously, with material like that, it's spread across the internet in minutes. But while the story presents a very memeable narrative, I have questions. I think it's healthy to show every story a critical eye, and so I have three questions I want to ask in turn. Firstly, how likely is it that the specific claims in the story are actually true? After all, even the most reliable sources on the planet can get it wrong, and historically I'd argue there are a few sources that have actually gotten it wrong more often than that age-old defender that's been plying their trade for centuries, the anonymous government official, which can really mean anything from a senior military commander down to Auntie Kathy's third cousin who checks the car park passes. Question two, if the allegations were true, what impact would they have on the effectiveness of the Chinese rocket forces? With the follow-on questions being, as per the article, what are the potential impacts on Chinese military readiness and strategic decision-making in the region? The reason I asked those last two questions is because it's important to assess the impact of corruption. When I did my original corruption video and covered a lot of examples out of Russia, a lot of the rebuttal basically came down to, if Russia is so corrupt, how are they managing to fight? And the answer, of course, is it's not binary. You can be both. Corruption doesn't explain why the Russian military or any organisation is incapable of functioning. It explains why it's less effective than it should be given all the resources available to it. Generally speaking, corruption just weakens an organisation. It's corrosive. But obviously only context, like some serious source of pressure, can make that corrosion lethal. Okay, so let's start by talking rockets. China's rocket force controls a wide array of nuclear and conventional ballistic, cruise and hypersonic missiles. It's the force that underpins a significant part of the Chinese nuclear deterrent, and in the war games for many escalation scenarios, this is also the force that gives China asymmetric options against many of the valuable systems and capabilities that potential competitors might have. This is the force, for example, that might be able to strike carrier groups hundreds or thousands of kilometres off the Chinese coast. It's the force that might feasibly be able to attack enemy air bases over very long distances. And given its very significant conventional and nuclear military role, it unsurprisingly has received a significant amount of modern kit. What you can see on screen there are two of China's most modern, most capable missile systems. On the top is the DF-41, a road mobile intercontinental ballistic missile which entered service in 2017. On the bottom is the DF-17 intermediate range missile with a hypersonic glide vehicle. And while I'm normally pretty conservative about making assessments on this channel, especially about very secret, very sensitive hardware, I'm going to tell you with a reasonable degree of confidence that operational versions of those missiles are not full of water. The reason is, they're both solid fuel rockets. So saying you've filled their tanks with water makes about as much sense as Dave telling you that he filled up the tank on his Tesla with diesel. It's probably not true, and if it somehow is, you have more problems than just what liquid was used. Quick military rockets 101 here for a moment. Broadly speaking, there are two technological families you can pick from when you're designing a military or indeed any large rocket. 
Liquid-fueled rockets would, as the name suggests, use liquid fuels. Actually, usually both a fuel and an oxidizer, so you can actually burn the fuel even in the absence of oxygen if, for example, you're in space. All else being equal and very broadly, liquid-fueled rockets have a couple of advantages. They're usually going to be the higher performance option, and it's easier to dial up and down the thrust at any given time. Solid fuel rockets, by contrast, they're going to use either solid blocks of fuel or powder or something similar. Compared to a liquid design, they're often going to have lower performance. So if you want to lift something heavy to the moon, you're not going to go there on a fully solid propellant design. But they can be simpler, more reliable, easier to store for long periods, and easier to fire on short notice. And so a lot of military rockets, from the AIM-120 air-to-air missile all the way through to the massive Minuteman III intercontinental ballistic missile, are all solid fuel designs. And because the laws of physics apply the same way in China as they do everywhere else, a majority of China's systems use solid, not liquid fuel. That said, there are exceptions in the Chinese ICBM force. The DF-3 IRBM, NATO classification CSS-2, entered service in the early 1970s, the DF-4 ICBM appeared in the mid-1970s, and the main player here is the DF-5, NATO designation CSS-4, which is believed to have first flown in the 70s and entered service in the very early 1980s. So if we're looking for Chinese nuclear-capable missiles that might be moonlighting as an aquarium, these are probably our candidates. I'm sure someone in the comments will remind me that the PRC has operated other liquid fueled systems in the past, but somehow I doubt that a corruption scandal that reportedly gave sheep pause related to a retired family of surface-to-air missiles from the mid-Cold War. So going forward, we'll assume we're talking about DF-3 through 5. But unless all the major estimates are wrong, that really narrows the field. DF-3 is believed to have been retired, so if it was full of water, it wouldn't really matter. DF-4 is also believed to be retired or retiring, with the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists suggesting there might be six missiles left without warheads. Then across the multiple versions of the DF-5, the BAS estimated 18 in service in 2023. So in total, we might be talking about maybe 6% of the rocket force's ground-based nuclear-capable ballistic missile launches. And assuming the more modern versions of the DF-5 are equipped with multiple independent re-entry vehicles, maybe 20% of the ground-based warhead count. And that's leaving out entirely the warheads based on China's nuclear missile submarines or that are intended for air delivery. Even if literally all of those missiles were compromised, China would still have a very significant number of deliverable warheads. And normally I'd stop there and move on, but I'm sorry, I still have an eyebrow left to raise. Because the story specifically talks about missiles being filled with water instead of fuel, with sort of the ha-ha implication being someone must have sold the fuel and filled it with water instead. And now yes, the missile probably shouldn't be full of water, but if there are any non-silo-based DF-5s left, they probably shouldn't have fuel in their tanks either. That may or may not be relevant to how China uses the DF-5 in 2024, but technically, I think it's interesting enough to deserve mentioning. Liquid rocket fuels are usually very angry substances. They have to be very energy dense and absolutely love to burn, and generally speaking, want nothing more than to burn at the wrong time and ruin your day. You can use materials that can be stored as liquids without supercooling, but the likes of hydrazine and nitric acid are incredibly toxic, and fuel combinations are likely to be hypergolic, meaning they ignite on contact with each other. That is a nasty collection of traits that will never get a thumbs up from the OHNS crew. And so while there are liquid-fueled missiles that can be kept pre-fueled, but doing so may not be entirely without risks. Now, of course, there's a dozen other things that might be going on here that explain the story. Maybe this was during some sort of test or exercise, the source didn't know what was going on and so made a mistake. Or indeed, perhaps there are a fleet of Chinese DF-5s out there that are meant to be on alert, that are meant to be pre-fueled, and are instead just a little bit of sugar and colouring away from joining the vitamin water craze. The point is that from a technical perspective, it's a weird story. Plus, when you talk about stories like this, there's always a chance that something got lost in transmission. Or, as the case may be, in translation. A lot of time, it seems like a complex message can't survive being relayed three times by email in a workplace. So just imagine what a process of intelligence gathering, translation, and secondhand accounts can do to a core message. Translation especially can be fiendishly difficult if those involved don't understand exactly what they're dealing with. Like, seriously, I'm not sure what I'll get if I feed Oi mate, I'm not here to f*** spiders into Google Translate, but I doubt I'll get an accurate rendition in Mandarin. And similar issues can apply in the other direction. I'm not saying that's what happened here, but let's just give one example. Take the Chinese word guanshui. Literally, I believe that describes the process of irrigation or filling something with water. But it has also been used in reference to the practice of merchants plumping up meat produce by pumping it full of water before selling it cutting corners, or even making low-effort posts on the internet. You can absolutely imagine a scenario where through layers and layers of relay and communication, a figurative or colloquial meaning might have transformed into a literal one. 
Again, I'm not saying that's what happened, but you can see why it might be too close for comfort. But more interestingly and more importantly is where this fits in terms of overall US reporting on China's nuclear force. Because remember, the story ostensibly flows from US intelligence gathering. But for years now, in its publications and public statements to Congress, the Pentagon and the US intelligence community have generally been describing a Chinese nuclear force that is not getting less capable, but much, much more capable. The 2023 report on China's military and security developments talked about the rocket forces as advancing long-term modernization plans and enhancing their strategic deterrence capabilities. And long before that, the 2022 Nuclear Post Review said that China was America's main pacing challenge and that China's nuclear modernization efforts set a trajectory towards, quote, a large diverse nuclear arsenal with a high degree of survivability, reliability and effectiveness, end quote. And while it's not impossible to do so, it's a bit hard to square a claim that China is moving towards a high degree of reliability in the rocket force if at the same time they still can't figure out what to put in the fuel tank to make the missiles go. So water in the fuel tanks? Not impossible. But it happening on any large scale? Probably not. But of course the story talked about more than just fuel tanks and so for sake of completeness, let's have a look at the silo thing as well. Because when you think about it, the only difference between a bunker and a tomb is whether there's a door that opens. And here, thankfully, the article is pretty specific. It refers to, quote, vast fields of missile silos in Western China that have lids that don't function in a way that would effectively allow the missiles to launch. Even with just that tiny bit of information, we can be pretty confident what silos the story might be talking about. Foreign analysts generally place China's existing DF-5 missile silos in the south of the country. Two small fields of nine to 10 silos each. Jilantai is believed to be a training field with about 15 training silos, not operational ones. But recent expansions have created two massive new fields in the country's northwest, increasing China's number of known ICBM silos by a casual order of magnitude. The construction of these silos has been tracked using satellite imagery, although the Chinese have erected inflatable shelters over the silos during the construction phase. This is obviously a very high-tech strategy for preventing opposing satellites from spying on your critical infrastructure, but thankfully for Ukraine, it's one that Russia appears not yet to have mastered. Knowing just how operational these silos are meant to be and whether they contain missiles is obviously very difficult, but we do have some hints that the US has already been counting at least some of them in their estimates of Chinese nuclear strength. At the end of 2021, the US Department of Defense published a report estimating that China had 100 ICBM launches and 150 missiles. In the 2022 report, that estimate was raised to 300 ICBM launches and as many missiles. That would seem to suggest, although it doesn't prove, that in the words of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, quote, the Pentagon possibly was including a significant number, but not all of China's new silos under construction in its ICBM launcher estimate, end quote. And also goes some way towards explaining why US Strategic Command reportedly notified Congress in December 2022 that at least in terms of ICBM silos and launchers, China's inventory may have surpassed the American one. What none of those reports or notifications included, however, was an explicit statement, one way or the other, of whether or not the silo doors were believed to work. So could some of these silo doors be faulty or non-functional? It's entirely possible. Even as sensitive and strategically significant as they are, things can certainly go wrong in nuclear missile silos. Back in 1980, for example, a US airman reportedly dropped a socket from a socket wrench in a Titan II missile silo, piercing the skin of the first stage fuel tank, touching off a series of events which would lead to an explosion so powerful that it would enter the silo's door in the Turret Toss Olympics and launch a W-53 thermonuclear warhead to its final resting place about 30 metres from the launch complex's entry gate. Like I said, liquid fuels are a bitch and you can all sleep well tonight. So is it possible for something to be faulty or defective or go wrong even in a nuclear missile silo? Absolutely. People are people. And when corruption gets involved, people can do fundamentally stupid things. But it seems unlikely to me that no one would notice if all the silo doors were defective. And even if we're talking about a significant proportion of them, the question is, what's the relevance? Let's assume, for example, that 80% of those silo doors, they're completely buggered. What does that actually mean for the missile force in the short, medium and long term? Well, in the long term, probably nothing more than inconvenience. We know China can build functional silo doors, so there's no reason to think they couldn't just repair or replace them. In the short term, a lot of the analysis I reviewed suggests that a lot of these silos are still waiting for their missiles and warheads. When US Stratcom issued the update to say that China had overtaken the US in launcher numbers, for example, they later reportedly clarified that it was only in launchers, not in missiles or warheads. So sure, in some cases you won't be able to open the silo door, but unless you're really desperate for some natural sunlight, with no missile in the silo, there's no need to. So it's in the medium term that you might see the impact be most acute, but here, the importance of that impact probably has a lot to do with the scenario you're imagining. 
If you're imagining a Chinese nuclear first strike scenario, then this could be really, really important. If you're trying to catch the opposing nuclear force unprepared and destroy it before it has time to launch, then if even one silo door malfunctions and a DF-5C stays in its silo, then that might be five or more targets that aren't waking up to a megaton level artificial sunrise. And if those targets are nuclear targets that are then able to shoot back at value targets on your side, well, on the scale of horrendous consequences, that's probably near the top, along with accidentally hitting reply all on a whole of office email. But trying to imagine a Chinese nuclear first strike against a power like the United States, even with the most optimistic assumptions in favour of the Chinese force, you're not just testing plausibility, you're taking the entire concept out back and shooting it. America's at-sea nuclear deterrent was too large, too advanced, and too survivable. America's missile warning system is widely believed to be the best in the world, and there just aren't enough Chinese warheads in infantry to credibly kill every Minuteman 3 silo. So the kind of scenarios where a shitty silo door would matter the most were also, mercifully I'd argue, ones that were incredibly unlikely to happen. Now, if you start modelling first strike scenarios against other nuclear powers, things do get more complicated. I imagine Indian planners, for example, would be very relieved if China's silos don't work for a couple of years, thus giving them more time to refine their own survivable at-sea deterrent. But I would hope that an all-out surprise Chinese nuclear counterforce attack against India isn't on anyone's bingo cards for 2024. Which means I'm going to switch now from first strike and nuclear warfighting scenarios to what, according to Chinese stated doctrine, is the primary role of nuclear weapons, deterrence. And in that scenario, as counterintuitive as it might be, a silo door that doesn't work might not actually be that much of a problem. Yes, you would obviously prefer it if it worked, but it might give you some value either way. How, you might ask? Well, a non-functional silo is potentially still a pretty good nuclear decoy. During the Cold War, both the United States and Soviet Union grappled with the idea of how to make ICBMs more survivable. Part of the Soviet solution would eventually be to introduce a number of road mobile systems. Because tracking a road mobile transporter that might be dispersed and hidden in a forest somewhere is a lot harder than a silo that doesn't move. The Americans, meanwhile, as part of the MX program, which eventually created the Peacekeeper missile, envisaged something called the Multiple Protective Shelter System. Essentially, a rail system would be used to transport the missile between any number of pre-prepared protective shelters. And because each shelter was hardened and protected by a little bit of distance, it wasn't practical to just wipe them all out using one or two particularly large warheads. Each would have to be engaged individually. This would essentially turn any counterforce effort into the world's deadliest shell game. The vast majority of shelters would be empty, but a few would pack very deadly payloads. And because nuclear planners are likely to be averse to playing games of Russian roulette, at least not when the consequence of losing is the destruction of Moscow or New York, one of the only real acceptable responses to a situation like this if you do choose to attack is to just hit all of them and fire so many warheads that you have an acceptable probability of kill against all of those shelters. And because that's going to require a lot of warheads, a lot of accuracy, and thus a lot of throw weight, what you've essentially done here is reverse the usual missile defense equation. Normally, the attacker might be advantaged because it takes a lot less effort to produce a single ICBM with a bunch of MIRVs on it than it does to produce a comprehensive missile defense system and enough missile defense interceptors to deal with those incoming nukes. But now the idea isn't to shoot down the nukes, it's to give them a prohibitive number of targets. And if you need to launch, for example, three missiles to get an acceptable probability of kill against one enemy missile, congratulations, the economics now favor the person doing the counter value retaliation. And everyone can go back to agreeing that nuclear first strikes are probably stupid and that the whole mutually assured destruction thing isn't all that bad. So worst case scenario, if you're about to get into a nuclear exchange with the People's Republic of China, I know, it happens to the best of us, if you have an intelligence report saying that 80% of silo doors in a particular field probably aren't functional, but realistically it's impossible to have a very high level of confidence over exactly which ones, then you may take a risk-averse approach and task hundreds of warheads against potentially non-functional silos, in Chinese geographical terms, the middle of nowhere. This then gives the silos a similar role to the way Americans describe their own nuclear silos, basically being a nuclear sponge, sucking up an opponent's nuclear firepower, and in so doing, maybe redirecting it away from more painful targets. So cheers Wyoming, I guess. I'm sure the other US states thank you for your brave sacrifice. And realistically, better intelligence probably can't solve that dilemma. Let's say through some miracle you actually know with an absolute degree of confidence which silos are non-functional. Given that the scandal has literally at this point been the topic of a story in international media, the nuclear power in question has probably cottoned on to the fact that others might think there's an issue. If that's the case and you can't manufacture enough components to repair all of the silos rapidly, 
One thing you can do is just invalidate the intelligence. Take some of those inflatable silo covers that you already have, bring in a bunch of heavy equipment and some replacement components, move them around in a manner which simulates repairs to all of the silos, then take the shelters back down, and once you've got proper security protocols in place, dare your opponent to guess which ones you actually fixed. Are there ways an intelligence service might deal with countermeasures like that? Absolutely. But we're talking about nuclear weapons here, so all you really need to do to introduce unacceptable risk into your opponent's calculations is inject just that slightest, most painful degree of uncertainty. Realistically, of course, even that's probably not necessary. The Nuclear Notebook estimates that China has 470-plus nuclear launches, including silos, tells, submarines and aircraft, and approximately 400 warheads to go along with them. Specific concerns about parts of the missile force probably would have been of more concern to China in past years. But now, at least in terms of nuclear deterrence, they're moving more and more towards the Russia category, where even if you assume a significant portion of the force is either non- or semi-functional, it's still large enough to be incredibly and sufficiently scary. So do I believe that all the DF-5s are full of water and the silo doors uniformly don't work? Probably not. But importantly, whether it is true or not, in the absence of other information, I think it's pretty safe to assume that nuclear deterrence remains in place. There is, however, an interesting final point to make here. And that is that, just as in the Russian examples we've looked at, one of the reasons I'm arguing that allegations of corruption or mismanagement or technical failure aren't as disruptive to the strategic balance as they otherwise might be is because they have to do with the nuclear force. Nukes are so dangerous that no one really wants to take chances when it comes to them, and a little bit of unreliability might be acceptable. Provided, of course, that it's the fail-to-launch kind of unreliability as opposed to the explode-in-the-silo kind. Systemic issues with equipment reliability or readiness would be much more concerning, however, if you talked about conventional forces. If a significant proportion of China's non-nuclear missile force, for example, had been deemed unreliable or had the fuel removed, then all else being equal, that might actually be more disruptive of the strategic balance. And to demonstrate why that might be the case, let's quickly have a look at a bit of math. Let's assume for a moment that the nation of Emutopia is planning a missile attack on Kiwiland using its fleet of newly deployed Magpie 2 ballistic missiles. And the key thing that senior decision makers want to understand is how many missiles do they need to achieve what result? Let's say the first set of targets are some undefended Kiwi military industrial facilities. Assuming for simplicity that the Magpie 2 is perfectly accurate and has a warhead sufficient to guarantee a kill if it hits, then if 20 missiles are tasked, one target apiece, then the expected result is 20 destroyed factories. If you start introducing technical failure as a factor because someone's brewing beer in the fuel tank or maybe some particularly enterprising sod ripped out some of the wiring in order to do some home improvement work, then the result diminishes in a linear fashion. A 10% reduction in reliability should mean 10% fewer destroyed factories. A 50% reduction should mean that half of the targets survive, on average. But let's instead say the target is a little more heavily defended. Here's a completely unrelated image, for example, of the Chinese rocket forces training against a target that looks suspiciously like an American aircraft carrier. Here, how many missiles make it to the target really matters, because the more missiles that arrive at the same time, the greater your chances, all else being equal, of overwhelming the defense system. If you fire 300 missiles in sequence, one after the other, like a bunch of movie bad guys fighting the hero one-on-one, -on -one, then that's going to be much easier for the opposing missile defense system to deal with than if all 200 actually arrive at the same time. And it's here that technical failure can start really punishing your side of this salvo model. If your magic number to get an acceptable PK against a defender target is to hit it with 20 missiles, for example, and your missiles have a technical failure rate of 50%, then your tasking requirements become pretty oppressive pretty quickly. If you don't fire enough missiles against your target to hit that saturation level, a lot of the impact of your strike is wasted. But if you just double the size of your salvos to account for a 50% failure rate, that's not going to cut it either. Your faulty missiles are probably not going to be perfectly evenly distributed across the force, so you might have strikes where more than the fair share of missiles are faulty and as a result you don't hit the saturation point and destroy the target. But if you just increase the size of the salvos even further to compensate, then you're going to have more and more cases where you are firing far more functional missiles than you need to destroy a particular target, until you reach the hypothetical extreme where the very frustrated EMU leadership are targeting the entire Magpie fleet against a single Kiwi carrier just to make sure they sink something. This is why issues of uncertainty, whether it be about the reliability of your equipment or the efficacy of enemy air defences, 
might be so frustrating when you're trying to allocate a limited valuable resource like a cruise or ballistic missile. Now, the Bloomberg article didn't include any specific claims on the impact of corruption on China's conventional and solid fuel missile force. That's important because it accounts for a majority of the rocket forces systems and those that are more likely to be used in a non-nuclear conflict. But while the Bloomberg article didn't touch on it directly, another story around the same time did. And this was a claim which reportedly originated with the account of a former PLA lieutenant colonel who defected in 2016, who attested that during his time in the service, troops would sometimes take the solid fuel blocks for missiles and use them as a fuel source to cook Chinese hot pot. Now, straight up front, we should note that this is a single anecdote by a lone individual who defected something like eight years ago. So the relevance to the PLA of 2024, I'd argue, is very much in question. But I bring it up for two reasons. Firstly, because it does relate to the solid fuel component of the force. And secondly, because if it is true, I would argue this probably represents the most inefficient form of corruption I have ever heard about. The efficiency, so to speak, of a particular bit of corruption is something which I explored in my original video on the subject. It's basically the relationship between how much value an individual manages to steal or misappropriate through corruption and how much damage they do as a result. If a procurement officer takes a $50 million bribe in order to pay $100 million more on a procurement that they didn't have to, then $50 million in corrupt proceeds has been generated, but $100 million in damage has been done. By contrast, if someone rips the wiring and all the valuable components out of a tank, they might make a couple thousand bucks, but in so doing, disable a multi-million dollar piece of equipment. But here you're talking about a value exchange which is even more insane, because the troops here allegedly weren't selling off components or fuel for monetary gain, they were potentially undermining the readiness of expensive military equipment in order to deliver the utility that could be matched by running a gas burner for a couple of minutes or burning some bloody wood. At its most extreme, you can imagine this sort of corruption disabling one or more missiles that as a result don't hit their targets, potentially saving millions or billions of dollars worth of opposing hardware from destruction, and then indirectly contributing to whatever damage those undestroyed enemy targets go on to do. So congratulations, you may just have impacted the course of a conflict at a strategic level. But hey, at least you've got some hot pot. More seriously though, I think this story should attract more than a few questions. Firstly, did it ever happen? Which is possible. Stupid shit does happen in the military and the 90s gave us plenty of horror stories. But secondly, I have to ask, when did it happen and how common was it? Thirdly, how did it happen? One quote in one version of the story said, quote, I would often go along to the armory and ask them for a small round piece of solid fuel when we wanted to have hot pot, end quote, which is very different from some of the other versions I saw which relate to taking the fuel out of a missile and generally suggests a practice which would be far, far less damaging than what some of the headlines seem to suggest. And then finally, is there any logical reason that if this ever did happen, it would keep happening? because I find it incredibly difficult to believe that troops would continue to find it more practical to disassemble missiles and that a military would turn a blind eye to them continuing to do so when the whole challenge could be much more readily solved with a quick visit to Amazon.com and the purchase of a few thousand electric or gas cookers. So unless some other very compelling evidence appears, I'm going to proceed on the basis that no, Chinese troops are not disassembling their ballistic missiles en masse for culinary purposes. Although the fact that someone may have done it, even once, remains undisputably hilarious. So bottom line, when it comes to conventional forces, corruption and technical reliability absolutely matters. And so I think it's time to test one of the article's more general points. The claim that corruption has undermined modernization and readiness to such an extent that it raises questions about China's ability to fight a war. And so here, what I'm really interested in is what we might be able to divine about the reliability of Chinese equipment, potential readiness rates, and how that might translate into combat power. We do have the example of Russia to serve as a kind of baseline, where corruption appears to have done things like sapped vitally needed state resources, delayed critical development programs, and provided a critical ongoing subsidy to the global mega yacht market. But it hasn't stopped Russia being able to deploy thousands of functional armored vehicles, hundreds of combat aircraft, and carry on both offensive actions and a missile campaign in the face of significant losses. Corruption caused the corrosion of the Russian force, sometimes quite literally, but it hasn't defanged it. And while storage standards and practices may in some cases have been utterly abysmal, we have plenty of evidence of the Russians being able to restore hundreds of vehicles from storage in better condition into service. So the question comes, what comparable evidence might we have about the serviceability of Chinese equipment? 
Let's start with the missiles. And I snuck in this image of a Chinese DF-3 missile earlier. Why? Because the missile shown isn't in Chinese service, it's being paraded by Saudi Arabia. The Saudis are believed to have purchased CSS-2 many decades ago, and then, many, many years later, the kingdom would reportedly go on to buy the DF-21 missile. Which is notable, because you might expect that if the DF-3 had been a dud, Riyadh's next move, all else being equal, may not have been to become a repeat buyer. And the reason I bring up the foreign buyer here is because while feasibly a country might have an interest in lying about the performance of its own weapon systems, buyers, and especially buyers who at the time had a very close relationship with the United States, are often going to be operating under a lot more incentive to tell at least someone how it actually is. Instead, in this case, Riyadh became a repeat buyer. The DF-5, which is the more modern missile and the one that's still in service, doesn't appear to have been sold abroad but has been tested extensively. China's Ministry for National Defense has acknowledged testing the DF-5C version. US media suggested a test in January 2017. And when China tested a hypersonic glide vehicle in October 2021, some US reports assessed the launch was likely to be a derivative of the DF-5 family. Now, obviously, a few successful tests doesn't prove that all of the missiles work, but it absolutely disproves any notion that none of them would. And one reason it might be unsurprising if China has some good, reliable, liquid-fueled rockets for its military is because we know the country has a lot of good, reliable, liquid-fueled rockets for civilian use. In terms of tonnage lifted into orbit in 2023, China is in a comfortable second place. In that year, China launched more than three times as many orbital missions as Russia. And they did that with a launch failure rate of below 2%. Technically speaking here, the comparison is actually more than skin deep. The original version of China's Long March 2 rocket, which has since been significantly updated but remains in use, was reportedly derived from, you guessed it, the DF-5 ICBM. So we're talking about relatively mature designs that get a lot of testing with the whole world watching. Beyond just large rockets, China hasn't been able to yet unseat powers like the United States at the top of the arms sales table, but the last decade has seen them close deals for Chinese-built systems with a wide array of countries, from Iran and Myanmar to Pakistan, Algeria, Bangladesh, Bolivia, Egypt, Ethiopia, and many, many more. Even Russia had actually made it onto that list well before February 2022. Because, according to CIPRI, after Germany cut off the supply of diesel engines for Russian warships after Crimea in 2014, the Russians allegedly turned to China for a temporary alternative. How these systems have then been reviewed by their respective buyers varies buyer to buyer and system to system. But the overall trend, especially with the disruption of Russia's position in the arms market, has been up, not down. Some buyers have, for example, had issues with the JF-17 fighters jointly manufactured by China and Pakistan. Reportedly, parts of the active fleet have had to be grounded on occasion, something which can happen to just about any aircraft design. And commentators from some specific countries have occasionally raised complaints about capability. But the JF-17 nonetheless forms a key part of Pakistan's air fleet. It's been used in combat, including against Iran, and it has flown in exercise conditions alongside the likes of tornadoes, typhoons, F-15s and F-16s. A very general observation then would be that most Chinese equipment tends not to be the flashiest, most capable system on the market. But the baseline for readiness and the ability to fight a war isn't that you're the best on the market, it's that you're good enough. And a lot of Chinese kit in foreign service has often appeared good enough. Of course, it could be argued that the record of Chinese equipment in foreign hands just tells us about the underlying technical capability of the equipment, not the readiness status of Chinese forces. And while yes, the Chinese military doesn't release the same sort of readiness rate data that we get out of the United States or Germany, we can derive a kind of flaw for our estimates on the readiness rates for the People's Liberation Army Air Force, or at least some units of it, based on just how often foreign powers can see their aircraft taking off and flying missions. This is important because if corruption had worn away at the ability of China to fight a war, as the article suggests, a critical element of that might be the ability of the Chinese Air Force to generate sorties, contest or gain air superiority, and service targets. And if we want to measure the ability of the PLAAF to generate sorties during peacetime, one relevant data point might be how many aircraft they fly near the island of Taiwan on an ongoing basis. In 2019, the figure for those sorties was somewhere between 11 and 20. In 2021, it was 972, and in 2023, 1,703. That means Beijing was able to maintain a sortie rate just using those aircraft within range of the island of Taiwan of roughly five per day in 2023, with some monthly peaks being considerably above that average, for example, August 2022, where the sortie rate increased above 400 per month. 
Meanwhile, more theoretical modelling has suggested the ability of the Chinese to generate sorties and the effect of those sorties has increased over time. A RAND report, for example, estimated that back in 1996, you only would have needed one wing of US Air Force fighters to win a battle of attrition against the Chinese Air Force in the area around Taiwan. By 2003, that number was 2.6 wings, and by 2017, it was 7. And while at sea, the PLAN doesn't patrol the world's oceans the same way the Americans do, I'm not sure that's really a useful baseline because no one patrols the world's oceans the way the Americans do, nor do China's stated strategic goals require it to. While Chinese vessels do operate further abroad, as we mentioned in our Red Sea episode, what we have plenty of real-world evidence for is their ability to operate closer to home, which is most of what they'd probably need to be able to do in many escalation scenarios. My core point here is that despite corruption being a very significant threat, something the Chinese government and state media say is a significant problem that needs to be fought, and one that can undermine everything from culture to procurement to combat readiness, I think it's vitally important that we don't lose sight of the overall trend. In a matter of decades, the Chinese military has gone from relying on license-built MiG-21s to fielding a growing family of domestically designed fourth and fifth generation fighters. The Navy has gone from being essentially a coastal force to fielding aircraft carriers, and in some specific technology areas, like hypersonic weapons, China isn't so much competing for peer status with other militaries as it is vying for the top spot. To use an analogy, serious corruption can be like having holes in your pipes. But the Chinese government may have been able to pump so much cash and so many resources through those pipes that even though corruption may have bled some of those resources off, enough has reached the end point to deliver some significant results. So I think to close out, it's actually worth taking a step back. Because ultimately, there's one last line from the Bloomberg article that stood out. The contention that US officials now believe that Xi is less likely to contemplate military action in the coming years than would otherwise have been the case because of these corruption issues. On its face, that statement borders on being a truism, because it doesn't say how much less likely Xi is to contemplate action, and I can't imagine any national leader being more keen for war after finding out that, yeah, maybe some of their expensive missiles don't work. But again, I think the question is, how much do revelations like these actually move the needle in a meaningful way? And here I want to make two points that might, on their face, seem contradictory. Firstly, the corruption in China might be far from the greatest factor when it comes to influencing the balance of power in the region. But secondly, just as the article suggests, its impacts may, nonetheless, give Chinese leaders and planners significant pause. To start with that first argument, I generally suggest that before these individuals were removed and this story came out, that according to many observers and commentators, the risk of all-out escalation in the region in the short term was probably very low, and that after the story dropped, the risk remained so. Because there are factors beyond just short-term military readiness levels in China, that are probably contributing to that strategic stability. Yes, there have been serious tensions in the Taiwan Strait in recent years, and no doubt some in Beijing will be more than a little frustrated with the results of the recent elections that took place on Taiwan. But if you're looking at the big picture analysis of how Chinese military forces might fare in any Taiwan Strait escalation, I'd argue there are many, many considerations that absolutely dwarf the impact of a decrease in readiness in parts of the nuclear missile force. In particular, things like the political will and policy of the United States government and their various allies, and the enormous military challenge that many escalation scenarios would present for the People's Liberation Army. Now, obviously, damage, both perceived and real, from corruption on Chinese military capabilities has the potential to weaken China's hand in the region. It might, for example, make some of China's competitors marginally more willing to confront it. But at the big picture level, I'd caution against overblowing the changes or the impacts. Corruption in the PLA is nothing new, has been openly discussed in Chinese government sources, and so to at least some extent has probably long been priced in to Western and Chinese assessments. At the same time, while China's modernization efforts might be hindered by corruption, all the evidence suggests they aren't being stopped by it. The flip side argument, however, might be that while we as foreign observers don't understand exactly how deep the corruption goes or what damage is being done, Chinese leaders may not be confident that they fully understand the impacts either. I'd argue the Russian invasion of Ukraine very clearly and painfully demonstrated what can happen when leaders don't have a fully realistic understanding of what their forces and the opposing force are capable of. Issues with some silo hatches or DF-5 missiles may not be that big a deal by themselves. But if you're a military planner in Beijing, you might be concerned that where there's smoke, there's fire, and that some of the systems and capabilities that your planning relies on may too have become victims in some way of corruption. As long as that uncertainty exists, it's going to introduce additional risk into any military planning and calculus. 
and that risk factor may have more influence on policy or major geopolitical decisions than just a couple of hatches that don't open or the world's most expensive ever hot pot. In conclusion, corruption has been a challenge in China for millennia. Years of crackdowns targeting millions of individuals has probably had an impact. But as these recent cases have arguably shown, serious problems probably remain. In terms of the revelations in the Bloomberg article, however, I would advise a little bit of skepticism and keeping everything in perspective. Faults in the Western silos or parts of China's fleet of liquid-fueled ICBMs, for example, may be politically embarrassing, but probably don't move the needle on the military balance that much. More concerning from my perspective would actually be rampant readiness issues with China's conventional weapons. And while the scale of the challenges faced by those conventional arms is ultimately unknown, I do think we have plenty of evidence that demonstrates that despite its corruption challenges, the PLA still has a very significant demonstrated capability to both build and field new systems and to project power abroad to a greater and greater degree with every year that passes. The impact of corruption in China is notable and should probably be studied and understood. But I think there could be significant risks in embracing too extreme a narrative. The corruption issue cannot be ignored. The damage it's ultimately doing remains unknown. And it does seem plausible that as more and more details become known, Beijing may want to focus time and attention inwards to assess the scale of the damage and try and overcome or at least reduce the problem. At the same time, foreign observers and planners should probably be careful about not overreacting. Assessing intelligence and the reports that come out with a cool head and probably resist any urge to write off the world's largest and fastest modernising military. Okay, brief channel update to close out. I didn't think I was going to be talking about corruption again for some time, and this was an unplanned release, but with all the attention focused on the scandals in the Chinese rocket force, I did think it was important to jump in and provide some big picture perspective. Next week, I'll probably be returning to some of the originally planned videos, but ultimately I hope you appreciated the quick diversion to Asia. I've long planned to do a more detailed video on Chinese military capabilities and modern systems, and we'll see if I get to it in the future. That's all from me for now. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you all again next week.